Okay, uh, it is uh, June 30th, 2017. I'm Doug Fairbairn. I'm here with uh, Pierre Lamont to uh, do his oral history. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate that very, very much. Uh, Pierre, in these uh, oral histories, we like to go back to the very beginning, where you were born, what your experiences were growing up, uh, whether your parents or siblings might have had a significant uh, influence in terms of the path that you chose, uh, your education, and then on into your um, okay. uh, career activities. So I understand you were born in France. Uh, tell me, uh, tell me about that time. Well, I was born in Paris, uh, 1930. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to high school in Paris. I went to engineering school in Toulouse, where I graduated with a degree in electrical engineering. And simultaneously, I did a degree in physics. Um, and then um, I was drafted in the French army, uh, you know, part of the military service. Okay, before we go on to that, I'd like to explore this, those earlier days. So you grew up in Paris? Is yes, that? Yeah, yeah. And uh, did you have siblings? Yeah, I have a brother, but he's uh, 10 years younger than me, so that's it. And. Uh, uh, he had no influence on me, <laughs> and I don't think I had a, any influence on him. He, he became an oral surgeon, which is a little bit far away from my field. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, during, you know, in France, there's a great emphasis in high school on math and sciences in general, and uh, happened to be pretty good in math. And there, uh, in France, it's typical, if you're good in math, you become an engineer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was young, I was... Uh, uh, playing with, at that time, uh, vacuum tubes and building a small radio that never worked very well, actually, very noisy. Uh, so I was interested in electronics, and I chose to go to a school that focused on, on electronics. There were, at that time, only two schools, engineering schools in France that uh, focused on electronics. One was in Grenoble, the other one was in Toulouse. This is a very different system than the United States, where uh, if you go to university in France, you study physics or chemistry or literature or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you want to be an engineer, you go to one of the uh, so-called uh, uh, high school of engineering, uh, translating from the French, haute école. Mm -hmm. And um, so there is polytechnic that everybody knows of, uh, uh, which means really means what it is. You know, it's poly multiple technologies, mm -hmm. but there are a couple of mining school, uh, a school of aerospace, a school of uh, chemical chemis chemical engineering, and there were at that time. Uh, this is in the 50s. You know, I, I uh, got into school in uh, 51. Uh, no, in 50. Sorry, and. Um, uh, there, was, there were two schools in uh, electrical engineering or electronics. And the school I went to, uh, just like the one in Grenoble, uh, I had to study power, uh, you know, electrical engineering to speak of, uh, hydraulics, because the, there was also uh, if a possibility of going into, you know, uh, building dams, so mm -hmm. to speak, and electronics. So. There was not that much focus on electronics. Okay, maybe. Be before we go into that, so I, I'm still curious about your growing up in Paris. So you were up, you were in Paris during the occupation and during oh yeah, yeah, World yeah. War II. Was yeah. that uh, what effect did that have? And that was not a fun time. Let, let me put it that way. <laughs> uh, it was very tough. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know. Uh, I'm the proof that you can survive. <laughs> uh, no, it, it was it was a very difficult time, and um, uh, you know I survived. Mm -hmm. What what were your parents doing? Uh, my father was a salesman, and mm -hmm. my mother was, uh, was at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know we didn't have much to eat and, and things like this, but uh, uh, we survived. You survived. Say. Yeah. What uh, did you develop an interest in electronics early on? Uh, were you doing any projects or hobbies or anything like well, that? Well, I developed an interest in electronics, mainly radios at that time, because we used to listen to um, Radio France Libre, Radio Free French, mm -hmm. from London. Mm -hmm. This was under General de Gaulle. Mm -hmm. It was highly illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I can't assure you to listen to that. But so I was always 
you know, feeling, well, it would be nice if we could get radios with, with less noise. I mean, it was a very noisy uh, signal. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was always interested in electronics, but uh, uh, it's only after the war that I could get a kid to try and build. Uh, at that time, I was 15 uh, when the war ended. And uh, so I started playing. You know, I, there's no other word than that. I was, mm -hmm. I was sort of trying my way around building a radio. And as I said, I, I built a radio that the performance was uh, not satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> I mm. won't lie about it. Out of but vacuum I, I was tubes. I was interested in engineering school. Uh, even though there was not uh, much emphasis on electronics, that's the area where I really studied, mm -hmm. because the rest of it, uh, you know, power transmission and things of this type, uh, well, not not of interest to me. Mm -hmm. um, many of the people that graduate for these schools, you know, end up working for the uh, electrical utility and, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, but that was not at all my interest. And uh, there was one interesting thing about that, that happened to me there. And in the last year of school, I was studying vacuum tubes. And my professor, I remember his name. <laughs> I don't remember many names, but I remember his name. His name was Nugao. And uh, at the end of the class, he said, you know, I've heard of an invention called a transistor. Now, you recall the transistor was invested, I think, 1947, 47, 19, 48, 48. Yeah. and now we are in 1953. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you know, I think that that's going to replace vacuum tubes. And that stuck in my mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got into the army, I bought a book. I, I spoke English, by the way, I should mention that. I, by the time I was nine, I spoke English. So I bought a book written by a fellow named Shockley. <laughs> uh, the first book, uh, the book that he wrote, I think the title was Electron and Holes. Uh -huh. And um, as I had a lot of uh, free time in the army, I read it. So you were drafted into the army after university? Oh yeah, uh, I, had, I was deferred and so I got into the army in uh, 54, mm -hmm. uh, not by choice. It was during the time of uh, war in Algeria, the French was fighting yeah. to keep French. So instead of staying in the army for 18 months, uh, they kept the draftees in for nearly three years. Mm -hmm. So I escaped from the army <laughs> in, early, uh, in late 57. But, um, that fellow, uh, Professor Nugao, had a, a big influence on what happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> So you read Shockley's book? Yeah. And I got more and more interested in that field. Mm -hmm. So I also taught myself some uh, solid, solid state physics, which I had not taken during my physics degree. And um, in the Army, uh, I became an interpreter because there were not many people that spoke f English fluently. Mm -hmm. And I also speak Italian. And so I um, was an interpreter from English into French. Now, how did you, did you take courses in English? You just, uh, how uh, did no, that? My, uh, my mother had some family in England. Mm. And so for a number of years, I spent a lot of time in England, which I frankly, did not like very much because I didn't like the food. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I learned English though. <laughs> so by the time I was nine, I was, I was pretty fluent. And uh, my mother spoke English. I see, okay. So I was pretty fluent in English. Actually, um, I mean, I couldn't say that I could go to England and they would think I was English, but I was, I understood very well. I spoke fluently mm -hmm. and I could translate. So, uh, you know, it's rare that the army understands. Uh, I, I don't have much respect for the army in general, but anyway, they discovered that I spoke English, and uh, and they needed translators because at that time NATO was headquartered in Fontainebleau in near Paris, mm. and French officers did not speak English. Uh, and so I had uh, the privilege of uh, dealing with a bunch of. Uh, 
colonels and generals and whatever translating f from English. I was a, a simultaneous translator, so right, I okay. would go from one language to the other. Yeah. And, uh, and I was working side by side with an American that was doing French into English. And uh, he said, you know, with all the degrees you have, and I'm quoting here, <laughs> uh, he ended up, by the way, being a professor of French at uh, Rutgers. But anyway, yeah. he said, why don't you go to the States? They are looking for engineers there. I thought it was a great idea, and he helped me uh, get an interview with a company called Transitron. Yeah, I have some questions about that. So... <laughs> Transitron was recruiting engineers in, in Europe. Uh -huh. uh, there was, uh, at the time, actually something they called in England the brain drain, where American companies would hire English engineers. But so uh, he found an ad in the New York Times uh, that the fact that they were going to recruit in France. And I got an interview. This was uh, early 57. Mm -hmm. I got an interview and uh, I went to the Hotel Georges V. I don't know if you know yeah. what the Hotel Georges V is, yeah. but it is one of the luxury hotels. Yep. Very uh, finest. Uh, to tell you the truth, I had never f set foot in the Georges V <laughs> before that. And I met a fellow named David Bacalar, yeah. who was the president and CEO of uh, Transitron. He interviewed me for one hour and made me an offer on the spot which I accepted uh, very shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, because I had been looking, I should uh, go back a minute, I had been looking, are there any companies in France that are working in semiconductors? Mm -hmm. And I found out that they were, but they were way behind the US. Mm -hmm. And I was attracted by doing research or development in semiconductors. so. I wrote off this company. Uh, I got an offer from one of them. Also got an offer from uh, Schlumberger, the oil exploration mm -hmm. company, because they were desperate to hire engineers that uh, spoke English. But I did not want to, Saudi, to go to Saudi Arabia, so I, that was <laughs> an easy turn down. And so I, um, uh, I accepted the offer from uh, David Bacalar, and uh, when I left the army, I applied for a visa, which I got in three weeks, and I came here on October 14th, 1957, <laughs> to work for Twenty-Twelve. And um, I got a shock when I got to the States, is that I landed in Boston, and I, the first person I talked to was a, a black guy that had a strong southern accent, and I couldn't understand him. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, here I am. I think I speak English, but <laughs> <laughs> they speak a different language. But anyway, um, I started working at Transitron in 57. And my first job was to work on a production line uh, under a fellow named uh, Vladimir Chernichov, uh, who was uh, Yugoslav mm -hmm. and spoke English with a strong accents where W's were V's and V's were W's. I <laughs> had a tough time in understanding him, but uh, I had been there about a few weeks working on the production. The idea was that I would be training on the production line for a while and then go into development. And uh, he left to go to Nevada to get a divorce. At that time in Massachusetts, you could not get a divorce unless, unless you could prove adultery. Yeah. And he had a problem with his wife and he had to go to establish residence in uh, Nevada to, so he could divorce her. <laughs> so I found myself with basically no experience running a production line where mostly m women, uh, except the uh, foremen were men, uh, and the women were mostly uh, Portuguese, the wives of Portuguese fishermen. So I needed to s go through the 
supervisor who spoke some English to get things done. Um, I really had a, an experience, but I learned a lot about how to make the transistors that we're making at that time, which were Gordon Junction transistors, silicon Gordon Junction transistors. Mm -hmm. And then after maybe four months or so, I moved to uh, uh, development. And then I found out something that bothered me, is that in American engineers with the same background as mine were making $6,000 a year, and I was making 5000 So because I was sort of brash, I went to David Bacalar, the CEO, and I said, why is that? If you don't raise me to 6000 I'm going back to France. So I got a raise of $1,000, and you know, $6,000 at that time yeah. made a difference. And um, I went in development. I, I worked for a fellow named uh, uh, David, I uh, can't remember his name now. Just escape me. Come back to me later. But uh, I worked in development uh, of uh, transistors, and at that time, we were going from Corn Junction to Mesa transistors, and uh, so I developed that, and um, I moved up very quickly in the development group, and after a while, I was running most of development. I had about 35 engineers working for me. I, I, I had a very quick rise, because when you think about it, I had maybe a year and a half, two years experience, and all of a sudden I've got a bunch of engineers working for me. Uh, I was uh, I was pretty good in, in that field, and uh, so were the engineers trained in solid state physics and things before? Or are they no. all? And that's one advantage I had. I was one of the few engineers that was knew something about electronics and knew also about how transistors really work. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, because, I, as I said, I had read that book yeah. and uh, and studied it really, so I really understood, you know, the whole idea of uh, minority carriers and doping uh, uh, levels in the emitter versus the collector, and uh, uh, how important is it to have a abrupt junction and you know things of this type. So um, that helped. Uh, what also helped is I understood. Uh, uh, I had a good feeling about what was manufacturable and what was not. And so I worked on development. I also uh, uh, worked on developing a solar cell and a signal core contract. And I made a, a solar cell that was uh, one centimeter by two centimeter and achieved it percent efficiency. Um, I hear history in solar cells goes a long way back. <laughs> yeah, and actually I got a patent on that, not on the solar cell itself, but on the fact to use an anti-reflection coating. Uh -huh. And this is where my background in physics helped. I said, you know, if we put a, a thin film in a quarter wavelength, which is not that difficult to do, you can improve the efficiency of the cell by quite a bit, and we got about a 2% improvement in uh, efficiency. And so, um, and I also did some work on epitaxy, and uh, I also tried to develop a high power transistor, and not successfully, I have to say. And uh, things were going pretty well. I was, you know, became director of development, and uh, I was advancing, and then sometime in, uh, Late 60, uh, at the ISCC conference, um, I gave a paper, and I have to admit I don't remember on what subject. In Philadelphia? Huh? In Philadelphia? Or In Philadelphia, right, yeah. exactly. And um, uh, a couple of days later, I got a call from Fairchild, uh, where Gordon Moore wanted me to come and work for him. Now. Sometime before that, uh, I don't remember exactly when Fairchild introduced the planar technology. Uh, I think it was somewhere around 1959, 1960, mm -hmm. that Joyony, you know, developed the idea of uh, planar. Mm -hmm. And I had gone back to uh, David Bacalar, my boss, and I said, you know, 
this idea that Fairchild has developed, that's the future. Mm -hmm. Because these basic transistors are not very robust to start with, and the yield is not very good. But I think plain art technology is the way to the future. And his response was, we have plenty of time to develop that. Let's stick to Mesa, and then we will second source uh, Fairchild. Uh, I said, you're making a mistake. Uh, developing this plain art technology is going to take time. Uh, you know, you, you have to develop an oxide-based, uh, 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 oxide masking-based uh, uh, technology in terms of uh, uh, doping and so on and so forth. I said, it's pretty, I think it's pretty difficult, and we should start working on this right now. And we sort of broke up on that. I, I got really upset that, uh, here, I'm in charge of development, and he tells me, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. um, they were very concerned about maintaining high margins. Uh, you, may, you probably know that, but in 1961, uh, Transitron was the number one company in semiconductor in the United States, mm -hmm. and Transitron was number two. And they plan on yeah, going The first public. one was, text, TI was first? Oh yeah, yeah. TI and was number one. Right, and Transitron number I'm two. I'm talking right. about semiconductor yeah. companies. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of manufacturers, I mean, RCA, Sylvania, there were a lot of people making semiconductors, but pure semiconductors, Texas Lumen was number one, Transitron was number two and they were planning on going public, mm -hmm. which they did uh, a little bit after I left. Uh, because I left uh, Transitron in uh, maybe April or May of 61 to join Fairchild. Okay, so before you get onto that, I want to talk more about Transitron. Uh, we actually did an oral history with David Bacalar. Oh. And uh, one of the things that he commented on was that he had a hard time competing with, for, for people, for recruits, with uh, companies on the West Coast like Fairchild. And he specifically said he started recruiting from Europe, of which you are you know, a perfect example, uh, because he could, that's where he could get, uh, had the better chance of recruiting engineers. Uh, and in fact, as you say, you know, they were you know, a leading manufacturer of semiconductors in 60, 61, uh, yet they were not able to you know, maintain their, their position, obviously. And so uh, I, I, from a sort of both from a management and technology point of view and also from a location point of view, one of the things that we talk about here a lot is the question of what makes Silicon Valley Silicon Valley and why is it successful and not other places. And, and you know, Transitron was a great example of a company that you know, had an early start. They started in 52 or 54, um, and uh, you know, were a leading 54. position. 54, and yeah. were in a leading position in uh, in 1960. And why, you know, why weren't they the winner or a winner as opposed to uh, Fairchild? And I was just curious as to, you know, was well, it management? I, was it location? What, you know, what was the? Um, well, I, I don't think that uh, David Bacalar was uh, historically accurate because he recruited me in uh, uh, 50, late 56. Mm -hmm. Fairchild was nowhere to be seen then. You know, Fairchild started in... Well, in fact, I was going to say, they, they, the, the people, the, the, the trader estate left Shockley on about the day that you landed in Boston. That's exactly right. <laughs> so that's about right. So the story that he went recruiting in Europe uh, because he w had competition from the East Coast, that, that is not co uh, the West Coast. That is not correct. Well, perhaps later on. Yeah. Uh, there were there were two things. First of all, there was a, a real uh, lack of uh, engineering talent in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, there are not enough engineers, mm -hmm. and so that was one reason to go right. to Europe. But the real reason is that he could pay European engineers uh, less, less than money. he would pay American <laughs> engineers. That was the real reason. Okay. And I was a brash one and I went and I said, I want to save money, yeah. but I can tell you, uh, there was a fellow that came from Scotland that was hired at the same time I did. He actually went back to Scotland. Uh, there were a number of us, so to speak, expatriates uh, working at Transitron, and he was taking advantage mm -hmm. of most of them. Okay, well that's good to know. 
That's why well, we do all the oral histories. Uh, you know, the, the issue that really uh, uh, made, uh, I mean, gave, made Transitron a failure eventually was that um, he, was, he had a second source mentality. Mm -hmm. He wanted to wait until somebody else did it uh, and then do it. Oh, I see. Because let's face it, he came from Bell Labs mm -hmm. and he translated Bell Lab technology into Transitron. Right. That's a nice way to put it. And, uh, and so he, he, he much preferred to be a follower than a leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, his brother, who was a financial guy, mm -hmm. uh, had no technology uh, background at all, but uh, was very, very interested in getting the highest possible profit margin so that they could go public at a high valuation. I see. Uh, I mean, don't misunderstand me. I, I, I liked uh, David Bacalar, and I think he was a uh, I mean, he was an entrepreneur mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, a PhD from MIT, as you probably mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. uh, very smart, but risk averse. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you run development and you work for a boss that's risk averse, that's pretty tough. <laughs> yes. uh, and so when I got this call from Fairchild, it took me a few microseconds to decide I wanted to do it. <laughs> Had you been tracking what Fairchild and others were doing? I mean, were you oh, very aware of what? Absolutely, uh, I was absolutely aware of what others were doing. I was aware of what, you know, there were a number of companies at that time that were still feeling that germanium would be better than silicon, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the Sylvanias of this world. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, um, you know, the, the, the rate of development um, was, it was extremely fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you think about it, uh, shortly after uh, Fairchild did the first plane out transistors, they were already thinking about the what became the first integrated circuits. Exactly. So, uh, you know, people think that uh, that there is a tremendous acceleration right now. Believe me, it wasn't slow at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, when I was at Transitron, by the way. Uh, I decided after I'd been there a couple of years that I would see if I could go back to France. Mm -hmm. And I took a trip there, but then I was married. Uh, and my wife would have preferred to live in France. Uh, so I went there and uh, looked to see if I could get a job. And that time I was probably something like 29. And I interviewed with a couple of French companies that then I had started to make semiconductors. And I talked to them and their response was, you know, you're a little bit young to be head of a lab. By the time you turn 45, then we will give you that type of responsibility. Uh, so I thought, well, that's, that's not going to work. <laughs> and not only one company, a, a couple of them. So I went back to the States, convinced I would stay there a while longer. Mm -hmm. So when I left to go to Fairchild in 61, my thinking was, first of all, it's nice to live in California for a while because I didn't like the winters in Boston. And secondly, I'll, I'll go there until maybe 1965, and then I'll come back with a real knowledge of Right. Uh, in te the technology, I go, can go back to France and I may be uh, able to write my own uh, mm -hmm. contract. But that never happened because uh, I joined Fairchild and uh, I was working for... So you were recruited by Gordon Moore and... Yeah, and he interviewed me. What position did you uh, come into? Well... Uh, <laughs> member of the technical staff uh, in R&D. But then uh, I worked for a fellow with another name I, f I forget now, uh, Ferguson. Mm -hmm. And a few weeks after I joined, he decided to leave to start, I think it was Signetics he started. Mm -hmm. He was the founder. Did you interview with Ferguson? No, I don't think so. Possibly somebody else, but I don't remember. Yeah, I think that he started, he was one of the founder, one of this fair children type companies. Yeah. And Gordon promoted me to run development. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, actually, for a while I worked under Vic Greenwich, mm -hmm. and then I worked for directly for, for Gordon. And I, I ran device development, which at that time was uh, more planar geometries, uh, the beginning of integrated circuits. Uh, we were doing uh, RTL and uh, trying to make a PNP transistor, a PNP planar transistor, which at that time we didn't understood was very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. NPN was easy, but PNP was difficult. And I happened to be sitting in the office that Bob Noyes used to have. So I was able to look at uh, Bob Noyes' notebook. And um, in the early days of Fairchild, they first tried to do a PNP configuration, and they had major problems. Uh, turns out that leakage current, uh, you know, due to sodium contamination. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they, then they moved to, uh, to NPN. And it's sort of interesting because if they had never moved to NPN, they might not have been successful, but... Uh, so this is all bipolar transistors. That was before, transistors. before my time. Right. And so we were making all sorts of NPN transistors. We were trying to uh, work in two areas, increase the power, or uh, increase the uh, uh, FT, the frequency of mm -hmm. operation. And uh, so I was running that, and then... Um, so this is all, bi all bipolar work, there's no... Oh, no, no. Then towards the... Uh, I stayed in, uh, in uh, under, under Gordon for about... I, I stayed at Fairchild for a total of about six years plus. Um, I started in 61 and I left in 67. And towards the end, uh, we were starting to work on, uh, on MOS. Mm -hmm. But um, I lost the train of my thoughts. You were going, I'm sorry for interrupting, you were going to uh, NPN. You said they were successful yeah, because of and we were, we were focusing on that and we were trying to go to higher frequency mm -hmm. and also higher power. And then, uh, we had at Fairchild uh, something that sounded like Fairchild University, but on Thursday mornings, other people must have told you that we had classes for new recruits. Mm -hmm. So, Chi uh, Tong um, Sa, um, who was at, at that time at Fairchild, would teach uh, uh, solid state physics. Uh, Gordon Moore, uh, would test or teach processing, and I would teach transistor electronics. I will tell you that story because it's sort of funny. One of my students at one point was a fellow named Andy Grove. <laughs> and at the end of the class, it was a, maybe 10 lectures or something like that. Because, you know, we could, there was no teaching of integrators, uh, of uh, semiconductors right. in most school, and right. Andy graduated with a degree in fluid mechanics. Um, so at the end of the class, I would give them as an assignment to design a transistor with this type of performance, you mm -hmm. know, breakdown voltage, uh, uh, FT, and so on and so forth. And uh, then uh, they would give it to me, and I would not grade it, but uh, criticize it. Uh, you know. Give them feedback. Yeah give them feedback. I had never any intention of putting these things into production because my job was to develop a process and a transistor and move it over to, to mm -hmm. production. And I didn't put Andy Grove's uh, uh, transistor into production, which he did not like. <laughs> many, many years later, in the early, maybe late 90s, uh, uh, Andy was chairman of the UCSF uh, campaign f to fund what is now Mission Bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife was on the board of uh, trustees of UCSF, so we get invited to a di launch, a launch di dinner. And she ends up sitting next to Andy. You know what Andy's first comment was? 
You know, when I was at Fairchild, I designed a transistor and Pierre refused to put it in production. <laughs> that was his first comment to my wife, <laughs> which, which I thought, I mean, this is 30 years You've ago. been waiting 30 years <laughs> to take that off his chest. You still remember that. Uh, I, thought it was, uh, I thought it was quite funny. <laughs> but anyway, Fairchild um, was a great laboratory for, for training people, you know, in uh -huh. many respects. And one of the reasons why there are so many companies that ended up coming out of Fairchild, it, it was a fantastic training ground. Mm -hmm. It was a, at the leading edge of the technology. It was for quite a while very aggressive in terms of uh, introducing new things, new product, new ideas on the marketplace. So it was a great place to work, no mm -hmm. question about it. And working, working for Gordon was fantastic because he's great technically, but he's a very easy boss. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I saw him actually a, a year or so ago uh, at a function for the Monterey uh, uh, Aquarium, and he's he's a really a great guy, mm -hmm. no question about that. And uh, one of the things I like about him is that he's modest. Yes, he is. I mean, he he doesn't boast ab about anything. Right. When you talk to him about Moore's law, he said to claim I invented the exponential. <laughs> I mean, this type of things. Uh, but anyway, um, I, intro I introduced a, a device, uh, a very high-speed transistor into production. And uh, we got a very big order from a company called Control Data. Mm -hmm. There was a fellow named Seymour Cray that was working, <laughs> was there. And he wanted to build uh, what was um, then the first supercomputer, you might say. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to use that transistor, which I think was a 2N709 or something like that. And uh, I had transferred it to production. Production couldn't make it. So Bob Noyes called me <laughs> to his office and said, Pierre, you did a great job in developing these transistors, but we can't make it. And we got this big order, um, 600,000 transistors to make, to put in one machine from this company called Control Data. I, we need to deliver. So I wanted to move to production and help out the production of this device. And this is how I moved from, from uh, development to, to production. And frankly, in retrospect, you know, it made sense. I, here I was, you know, I had basically the equivalent of a master's degree, and I had a bunch of PhDs working for me that <laughs> wanted to do the next new thing. Mm -hmm. And so it made sense for me, I thought, to move to, uh, to production. So I ran the production line making these high-speed transistors. And I had some problems with my boss. I didn't think he was very good. And as I've told you, I was sort of brash, so I went to my boss's boss. At that time, it was Charlie Spork, and I said, you know, I can't go on working for this guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a manufacturing guy, but he no, has no experience in transistors, or in transistor manufacturing, or semiconductor manufacturing, and I, I, I just can't work with him. So, uh, I hate to say it, but I managed to get my boss fired, <laughs> and I replaced him. So I ran all manufacturing, uh, the, the, what is now called, you know, the wafer fab. Yeah. And uh, I did that for a while. So did you get this uh, transistor yes, sir. into volume yeah. production? And I got it in volume production, and it was big contributor to profitability to the company. Mm -hmm. But there was another thing that was Going from the side, there was uh, uh, integrated circuits, the RTL family of devices. And so uh, I was moved from manufacturing to running, they made it into a division, uh, running the integrated circuit division. And that was, must have been uh, 1965, mm -hmm. early 65. And that division grew like crazy. Um, in 65, I think 
we did about $45 million worth of business with uh, a gross margin that was obscene, uh, 75% uh, type of gross margin. Mm -hmm. It was the most profitable uh, division of Fairchild Camera and Instrument <laughs> of the whole parent company. All right. Uh, I moved there in 64, actually, because I was there for two years. But then, uh, in 66, I started to become NC. Here I was running this division. Um, it did 45 million in 66, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to Charlie Spork and I said, you know, I enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, it's very satisfying. But here I am, I have a thousand shares of option. I'm running a $45 million business, generating $20 million pre-tax. I don't feel I'm being rewarded properly, so I'm thinking of starting a company. And that should tell you how uh, naive I was at the same time. You know, I went to my boss to tell him I was planning to leave <laughs> to start a company. <laughs> But I, I'd become very friendly with him, you know. And this is 66. Yeah. Uh, huh? This is 66. This is 66, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I had been approached by a an English company called Plessy mm -hmm. that had semiconductor, a semiconductor operation in Swindon. And the company was run by a fellow named Clark, Bob Clark. Uh, and uh, he wanted to start a company in the United States. And, you know, I was well known enough that he approached me mm -hmm. about uh, maybe leaving Fairchild. And so combination of things happened. I talked to Charlie about the fact that I plan on leaving. And I said, you know, I have these people that they have some money and I could start a company here. And this is what I would really like to do. So you had seen a number of other people leave Fairchild, start companies, and so this was... Yeah, but I, I, yeah, exactly. And uh, I was sort of, you know, as I said, I was sort I knew him, I thought he was my friend, and I said, you know, this yeah. is what I plan on doing. And then things progressed and were going on. Then one day, Charlie said, you know, if you leave, I'll leave with you. And so he said, why don't you start recruiting a team uh, so we can start a company? <laughs> And uh, uh, I was sort of, I mean, you always always throw back, you know, I still think, how did this happen? Uh, it's sort of strange, right? And I go on w talking to Clark in, uh, at Plessé, and then he hired a lawyer from New York to help on negotiating the deal. And when the lawyer found out that I plan on having 50% of the company for the founders, he said, are you crazy? <laughs> uh, no way. So uh, we're back down to ground zero. In the meantime, separately from that, there was a company, National Semiconductor, that got started in, uh, by people from Sperry. They were in Denbury, Connecticut, but then they acquired, if I remember correctly, Molectro. And I had lost two people to Molecto. One of them was David Talbot, and the other one was uh, Bob Weidler, mm -hmm. uh, the inventor, really, of uh, analog integrated circuits. And they, uh, Bob Weidler and Dave Talbot, went to Peter Sprague and told them you should hire Charlie Spork to run National Semiconductor. Mm -hmm. So. Peter Sprague, this is the way I remember Peter it. Peter Sprague was the He was the chairman, chairman of, chairman of uh, you know, he invested in National uh, when National was in really deep trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about running about nine or $10 million in revenue, was being sued by Sperry, and, uh, and uh, Peter Sprague, uh, you know, is, had a lot of money as a young man because his father had died and he was part of the Sprague family and mm -hmm. he was getting advice uh, to invest his money and he became the major investor in National. And so uh, 
uh, Steve Talbot and uh, Bob Wadler went to him because National had acquired Molecto and they were part of it. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you hire Charlie Spock to run the company? Because these guys from Speria are not very good. So all of a sudden, um, Charlie negotiated with Charlie Sp uh, with uh, B Peter Sprague, and um, we joined National. In the meantime, I had recruited uh, a few people to come with me. Uh, one of them was Roger Smollett. Uh, one of them was uh, Floyd Kwame. Uh, Charlie recruited Don Valentine. Flood Kwame at that time was marketing manager at, uh, at uh, Fairchild for Integrated Circuits. And Don Valentine was in charge of sales. And I So you had had a bunch of side conversations and said that yeah, you were Yeah, side conversations. The whole team came from Fairchild. Yeah. A fellow named Ken Moyle, mm -hmm. who was actually an MOS guy. And uh, there was somebody else. I, and obviously I knew uh, Bob Weidler because he worked for, he had worked sure. for me. And I knew Dave Talbot because they had worked for me too. So we put all this group together and this is the way we restarted, we started National. And you moved it about here to Silicon Valley from Danbury, Connecticut? No, no, they were, in, they were here. Oh, they were here. Oh, because they were- Dave Talbot and Bob Weidler right. were at, were at uh, Fairchild. It was a big loss when I lost them because uh, I've got to tell you, over all the years, and I've been you know, in business for a long time, Dave Weidler is probably the best engineer I ever worked with. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable. Very inventive, extremely thorough, uh, no, leaving no stone unturned. I mean, when he developed a product, I'm talking in, in integrated circuit. Right. When he developed a product, he really developed it, including application notes, um, and th incredible engineer. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, major problem with alcohol, mm -hmm. but incredible. I mean, every product he ever developed was successful. We can say that of many people. But um, so we moved on to, to National, which at that time, believe it or not, was a public company, even though it had $10 million in revenue. And the stock was trading over the counter for, I think, $3. When it became public that we joined the company, it jumped to 12. And we raised a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We sold stock in the secondary. We raised $3 million. At that time, that was enough to equip a uh, fab to make integrated circuits. Uh, it didn't cost that much money. And uh, we took over National and uh, one of my first duties was to cut the cost in Denbury, where we were making uh, transistors and things of this type. So they had a transistor fab in Danbury. Exactly, yeah. Uh, did you uh, uh, interview anybody from, from these early days at National? So uh, they had- Well, Charlie himself. Um, yeah. I don't know if we have any of the others. Yeah. Um, Denbury was a mess. Oh, Floyd, yeah. Ah, Certainly Floyd. Floyd yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll give you some in, uh, background on Floyd as well <laughs> <laughs> as it comes. Uh, but uh, Denbury was a mess. So, uh, oh, yes, there was another fellow part of the team, Fred Bialik, mm -hmm. who had experience in manufacturing. He used to run the diode plant for Fairchild. Mm -hmm. Very, very good manufacturing guy, very tough. So he and I flew overnight on a Sunday night. We flew, arrived in Denbury on Monday morning. And we arbitrarily laid off one third of the people. And I, I mean, it was arbitrary. You name up, I mean, we had to cut the cost. It was way, way overstaffed. Mm -hmm. So, we turned an operation that was losing money into an operation that was at least break even in a few months. And, uh, and uh, Denver, we ended up reporting to Fred Bialik. I was running integrated circuits, he was running transistors. Um, 
although, as you know, uh, we didn't stay in the transistor business very long. But anyway, um, I joined uh, Floyd Kwame. Uh, I had recruited him to become the marketing uh, manager. And um, before I left uh, Fairchild, I got a call from Bob Noyce trying to get me to stay. And I was very friendly with, with Bob. Uh, it was also a family, and we knew the mm -hmm. you know, uh, families and so on and so forth. And I said, no, I've decided to leave, and I told him why. Um, and he says, okay, I understand. Although I have to tell you that sometime in 1965, Bob gave us a talk to the staff about the fact that uh, there would be no more semiconductor companies started because there was now Fairchild, Motorola, and Texas Instrument, the big three, just like they are the big three in automotive, Chrysler, Ford, mm -hmm. and General Motors, and there will be no more companies started. Uh, that's to show you how you, you should never forecast the future. <laughs> <laughs> he changed uh, his mind a few years later. He uh, changed his mind uh, two <laughs> years later or three years later. Uh, but um, in some respects, you know, he was right. There was no venture capital. My, my problem in wanting to leave Fairchild is that I could not find any, there was no venture capital. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Arthur Rock, you know, had started, uh, had financed, it had arranged the move of uh, to to shock to Shockley, but it was not uh, you know it was not venture. Uh, right. It was totally different, and uh, uh, you could not find it. Um, you know, J. H. Whitney, uh, uh, they were they were in venture, but they they're not interested in technology. They were mm -hmm. interested in investing in uh, uh, TV stations and, and things of this type. So I could not find any venture capital. I had some uh, connections on Wall Street, but they were useless. Mm -hmm. Bankers, you know, I had right. connections with Goldman Sachs. Right. But, you know, <laughs> they didn't do venture. So anyway, and the world probably did not exist then. So anyway, we are at, um, at uh, National, we raise some money, uh, and uh, we get going. So, so what was the plan? What was the... The strategy plan, in terms of the plan of the was uh, we were we were not going to do RTL or DTL or whatever we were going to go and compete in on you know, the digital side with TI, mm -hmm. which at that time was making transistor transistor logic DTL. DTL, which had major advantages over DTL or RTL, and uh, we approached it from a very interesting point of view. Instead. You know, normally you compete and you say, well, we're going to make the simple devices first and then uh, we'll go move on to more. Mm -hmm. Instead of that, we went the other way around. And while uh, uh, there were a lot of sales of uh, dual input gates and simple things like this, we went into comp what at that time <laughs> were complex circuits like, you know, decade counters mm -hmm. or multiple uh, quad flip-flops, I don't mm -hmm. remember exactly, but we went to the high end mm -hmm. because we thought there's more demand there, the average selling price is much higher, the cost is not that different, and we will, uh, we can pay it, we can fight TI that way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was a great strategy from a product point of view. The other great strategy, in my opinion, something, uh, did you interview Don Valentine? Yes. One of the things Partly that I give anyway. credit to Don uh, is to say, we don't really need, because the normal thing would have to be to you hire 10, 12 salesmen. Mm -hmm. His idea, very smart, now everybody does it, reps. So he would go to the best, uh, salesman from Texas Instrument in a particular territory, let's say Boston, and tell him, why don't you start a rep firm? And I will help you, I'll give you, you can sell national semiconductor product and I'll help you getting some other lines. Mm -hmm. And so he helped develop the, a whole network of reps, including in the Bay Area and everywhere else. And so we did not have the cost of having to hire salespeople that 
sell very little at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, we gave up some of our profit by giving a commission to these uh, right. reps, but it was at that time a revolutionary idea. And Don, Don was a, a really great salesman. And he, he helped us considerably from that point of view, um, quickly sell, because we needed to sell quickly. So were you responsible for getting the wafer fab up? And, and I'm sorry? What were your responsibilities going international? Well, I was running everything uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Santa Clara. Okay, so development as well as manufacturing. Yeah, everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was running everything. I was the general manager, everything. Okay. I had development, whatever that was, because mm -hmm. it was not big. I had production. So you everything. had to get the, you had somebody bringing up the wafer fab and. A everything, yeah. Right. And, uh, and then uh, we quickly, and I forget which year, but we quickly established a assembly facility in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. I think it was maybe two years after we got started, like, you know, 68, early 68. We rented a flat in Hong Kong and started assembly parts in Hong Kong. And that was the beginning of uh, what the National turned out to excel in production, manufacturing mm -hmm. capabilities. We were by far the best uh, manufacturer of semiconductor for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, eventually, you know, man, everything turned to everybody. Eventually, eventually, you get the absolute and everybody gets at right. the same level. But for a long time, our manufacturing efficiency, our manufacturing cost were a lot less than anybody else. And um, I think it was in 67, 68, because that's the first time I went to Hong Kong mm -hmm. to visit the plant. I mean, the flat where we were assembling. So we did two things. We tried to attack the market from the high end as opposed to the low. Eventually, we also made uh, simpler devices, but also we focused a lot on cost at all, at all levels. I know things were not easy because, for instance, there were no available uh, integrated circuit testers in the marketplace, on the, on the market. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Fairchild had their, their own, because they had Fairchild instrumentation, mm -hmm. and they refused to sell to us. It's sort of interesting, they finally woke up to the fact that we had left with some of the key people, that we were, ne we were not sued, um, but they refused to sell us. Into so I met a fellow named uh, Alex Dobolov, who had started a company in Boston called Teradyne, mm -hmm. and his co-founder, was a fellow that I had met, uh, his last name is Wolf, a fellow that I had met when I was at Transitron. So I contact, he contacted me and said, we're developing a, a tester for integrated circuits. I was his first customer. It was not easy because yeah. until then we didn't have a real high speed tester, so right. we were testing these devices basically on, on jigs, you know. Yeah. It was yeah. very inefficient. By the way, we ended up still testing analog circuits for a long time, um, you know, one, one test station after another because there were no testers for analog circuits. So um, you were, uh, National then already had analog circuits that Widler had developed or? They had not launched them yet. Oh, they haven't launched them yet. And that okay. was one of the reasons they wanted uh, Charlie to join because uh, they, they had a lot of problems getting things done. Okay. Uh, they had a fab which was not uh, not directed to making integrated circuits. So the reason we raised some money is to buy the right furnaces and the right alignment tools and things like this to um, uh, to make integrated circuits. But you know, it was really hands-on. Like uh, I got there, and one of the first things I did was to set up the furnaces. Roger Smart and I would, uh, you know put the gas lines together and um, I always remember that we were using uh, arsine to get arsenic into, as a, which is an N-type dopant. And the way we found out it was working, we would smell to see, <laughs> do we have any, uh, uh, it tastes like garlic. Mm -hmm. it, it smells, could see if there was any flow. Uh, it was 
you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the reason I'm living so long, is I, I had some arsenic. <laughs> uh, no, it, it was uh, really hands-on. Everybody was uh, yeah. working um, very hard. I mean, I, for the first uh, three years or so, uh, we had a, all hands on board on the last week of the months to help shipments. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was a famous story about me that you, prob you probably have heard, is that one day, this is in the early days of National, I used to always get there at seven o'clock in the morning and the famous, you know, management by walking. I didn't know that existed, but that's what I did. I would go through everything first thing in the morning. And I go to a shipping dock and I see a guy sitting there reading a newspaper. I go to him and I say, you're fired. He was working for Pacific Bell. <laughs> you never heard the story? No. Because a lot of people know the story and they tell it in a different way. That's the real story. <laughs> I was walking there, I see somebody reading a newspaper. <laughs> not on my, <laughs> not on my time. So, I had a few things of this type. <laughs> don't believe everything you hear. <coughs> um, the other one in 1970. How did he respond when you said he was fine? No, he, sa he said, I work for Pac Bell. And I sort of <laughs> 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 the other story that's uh, uh, sort of funny in the early days of 1970, 71, uh, it was not a good year from an economic point of view, so mm. I was cutting costs like crazy. And. Um, I decided to stop mowing the loans uh, on, on what mm. is called semiconductor. Yeah, I did. And, and so Bob Weidler bought up a sheep. <laughs> you heard the story? I heard something about some, uh, but I yeah. go ahead. So tell he, me. he had a convertible car, and he brought he put a sheep in it and put it there and uh, attached it on the loan so I could see it from my office. Right. <laughs> uh, it's true. I mean, it's a true story. The only problem he didn't realize that nobody wanted to ride with him afterwards because the car <laughs> smelled so badly. <laughs> so there were a few things like this, um, but um, and we, were, you know, we were we were growing uh, pretty quickly uh, at uh, at National. Um, I think by 1970 we were about 70 million dollars in revenue, something mm -hmm. like this, um, and uh, but. It sort of leveled down a little bit uh, because of the of the recession. I said to myself, "Okay, I've worked for Charlie Spork uh, uh, long enough, and uh, I need to run my own company." Mm -hmm. And I got an offer from a company uh, called Coherent. At that time, it used to be called Coherent Radiation, to run it, to become CEO. Mm -hmm. It was a laser company. Mm -hmm. um, I was very interested in laser because when I had done my degree in physics, I had done a lot of work on, on optics. And I went there, it was a $16 million company losing money. Um, so I turned it around and then decided that lasers were really interesting from a physics point of view, but it was not a big business. It was the famous solution in search of a problem. Although. Some things happen, like you know, uh, they did the the first uh, laser photoagulator for people that have diabetic retinopathy, uh, which is a bleeding of the back of the eye. Mm -hmm. You use a laser, uh, the the green light of argon, to s stop the bleeding. Um, it sounded like an interesting um, product. My marketing manager, I asked him, "What do you think is the market?" He said, "Well, you know, maybe five or ten in the world." Um, <coughs> when I left the board of Coherent in 1985, they were selling 100 a month. <laughs> uh, there are a lot more people who were diabetic. Yeah. So I was, not, I was not too happy there. And Peter so what, what were the things that you did to turn the company around? I mean, what, what steps had to be taken? I cut the cost. <laughs> uh, there was no special thing to be done because it was not, I mean, we were making carbon di uh, dioxide lasers for high power. We were making argon lasers primarily for research. We were making helium neon lasers, you know, for red lights. 
Uh, we actually sold some of the first ones to the early days of scanners, you know, mm -hmm. the vast scanners. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was a business that was growing fairly slowly mm -hmm. and uh, that didn't, didn't have the same energy that you have in semiconductors. But on the other hand, Peter Sprague said, you know, I'm an investor in a company in Boston um, that's developing uh, a projection TV. Uh, and uh, I looked at the technology, I thought, boy, this is interesting, and TVs is a big business, so might be interesting. So I moved my family to Boston, and I stayed there for about a year, running uh, Advent, and they had, Advent is a, is a company making speakers, mm -hmm. uh, but the founder of Advent uh, had developed this technology to, for high power uh, projectors, projector. It was the three tubes, you know, green, yeah. uh, red, and blue. And you may have seen it in airplanes. Mm -hmm. They used to use. That's yeah. an invention of, of this company. But um, it became clear to me that we could not compete long term with the uh, Japanese uh, and, or the established uh, uh, TV companies because they would copy us. And mm -hmm. sure enough, uh, that was happening. So I had a difference of opinion with Peter Sprague. In the meantime, I had stayed on the board of National uh, because I, when I left, uh, um, I ended up joining the board of the company. When I left National, I joined the board. I was not on the board before. <laughs> and uh, Charlie said, you know, I need you back. Mm -hmm. I have a problem, I need you back. So I left that vent. Um, I had a problem there that I, taught other people, never, if you're going in in a company to turn it around, get rid of the CEO. I didn't. And uh, I, I got there and there was a, always a group plotting. Oh, I see. So it was a bad, a politically bad situation. Mm -hmm. So I came back to National and uh, you know the guy that used to publish that weekly letter there, New York, uh, Heffler? Eric, huh? Don Heffler? Yeah. Uh, wrote two articles in succeeding weeks. One said, um, bad news, Pierre's coming back to National, uh, is uh, Charlie Henchman is going to, um, you know, get, uh, ha going to be major, major layoffs. The next, and by the way, uh, Floyd Kwame, I mean, Floyd Kwame is, is going to get it. Uh, <laughs> he's going to get fired. The next week he said, Great news, Pierre Lamont joined National. They desperately need somebody like him with his technically. It's a perfect journalist type of thing. One week you say no, the next week you say yes. Then, anyway. So, what was the problem that Charlie wanted you to come back and address, or what was uh, the They had a major problem in development. Major problem. They had fallen behind and uh, uh, not, not investing enough mm -hmm. or investing in the wrong things. And uh, I went there and uh, I ran um, advanced products, you know, MOS and memories and, uh, and the early days of the microprocessor and things like this. And uh, I, I helped get the company back uh, on, uh, on track. Uh, but, um, you know, I still had that urge to run my own company. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, Bob Swanson left. And uh, he came to me, he was working for me. He was running uh, the uh, linear integrated circuit uh, right. division group. And he told me, you know, uh, the company is coming very big, very bu bureaucratic. Uh, you remember in 1960 or 60, uh, not me, I mean 60, 1979, uh, uh, or 81, uh, National was close to a billion dollars or, mm -hmm. or so, I mean, very close to that. Uh, very, the company is becoming very bureaucratic. I'm not enjoying myself. I'm leaving to start uh, a linear circuit company. And he took Bob Wardler with him. Uh, that was a it was a big blow, but I had expected something like this, so I had hired somebody um, Bob, I forget his name now, to back up uh, Widler. So it was not that much of a blow to 
to to national, but it made me think: Do, do I really want to wait to stay here? Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie is only three years older than me. He's not ready to retire. Am I going to go on doing this for the rest of my life? So um, I left. I told him I was leaving, and I left uh, at the end, uh, middle of '81. So how long did you stay that second time you came second back? Second time I came back in 78 and left in 81. 81. So I was gone from 76 to, se I was gone two years, uh, basically. Did you feel you mm -hmm. got the company back on track with respect to the development? Yeah. But there was some major difference of opinion between Charlie and I. Mm -hmm. uh, sometime uh, in, uh, we decided to get into the business of supplying uh, memories for large computers, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Memory compatible, systems. Yeah. Compatible memories. Mm -hmm. And that it was okay because we could use defective memories. Yeah. And, and you heard the story. Right. So you, you could use defective memory and, and sort of by putting all them together, you could offer uh, memory at a very good price. But then from there, he decided to buy a company called ITEL mm -hmm. and to get into the Com uh, the IBM 360 compatible uh, mainframes. I started to feel that uh, he was losing track of what the company was about, which mm -hmm. is semiconductor. And uh, and Floyd Kwame, by the way, was the one that was pushing going into systems. I thought it was a terrible mistake. It was an even worse mistake when I decided to second source a full, a full product that decided to second the source, the PDP series of, I forget which number, but one of the PDPs of, of DEC. Mm -hmm. Now, DEC was my biggest customer on the semiconductor side mm -hmm. by a lot. And uh, I got a call from DEC, I went there and they said, we don't want to do business with you anymore. So that really annoyed me. Uh, but Charlie and, and Floyd were moving hard in the direction of making uh, uh, c computers. They set up a plant in San Diego, if I remember correctly. And I was, I, I was just, I felt, you know, they also got into the business of making cash registers. Mm -hmm. That was under Fred Barlick. And I thought, you know, this is a semiconductor company. And trying to compete with your own customers. We're, we were then competing with NCR, so right. it doesn't make sense. So there was a divergence there, and I thought, you know, I, I, I'm too young to, uh, um, to go through that, I mean. So I left with no uh, plans. I wasn't going to go anywhere. I decided to do some consulting. And, um, and one of the guys that called me was, uh, was Don Valentine, and he said, I could really use your help uh, on investments in, uh, in semiconductors. Uh, at that time, he was thinking of investing in uh, what became LSI Logic. Mm -hmm. um, but, so I was doing some consulting. I got a call from DEC, and I did some consulting for, for DEC on the semiconductor side. Um, I did some consulting for Gould, because they used to own AMI. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was looking to see what I wanted to do. And then Don got more, more and more of my time. And at one point in time, he said, you know, I'm raising a, another fund. Why don't you join me as a partner? And then if you find a job somewhere, you, you can leave. So in 82, I made 82, he raised a Sequoia Capital three, I think it was. Yeah. And um, I joined him as a partner. And uh, when the first investment I ever made was a, a company called 3Com. Um, it was um, uh, started by a fellow named uh, Metcalf, Bob Metcalf, sure. who is uh, probably the in inventor, if you say, of uh, the internet. Oh, I shouldn't say the internet, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, uh, I joined, it's, it's not the internet that he invented. But anyway, I joined 3Com, and um, the idea, uh, you know, was sound pretty pretty good to me. So uh, we invested, if I remember correctly, about five hundred thousand dollars, and um, 
I joined the board and um, <laughs> uh, how should I put it? It's a, uh, it was pretty evident to me that Bob was uh, very bright but was not a manager. So uh, this is, uh, happened to me more than once. So I, I told the board and there was uh, Dick Kramlick on that board and uh, another fellow whose name I forget but it was an ex HP a guy and I said you know Swecom um, is, is, a, is a good company but it's going nowhere with uh, Metcalf as a CEO so we need to find a, we need to replace uh, Bob Metcalf and so we did replace <laughs> Bob Metcalf and the company did a lot better than um, than uh, than with Bob, and, and uh, it was a great investment. So I thought venture is easy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, you put money one day and you clip your coupons the next day. <laughs> uh, it turned out that's not exactly the case, because then I did another company that was not successful, but then I got involved over the years at, uh, at uh, Sequoia with a number of very successful semiconductor companies because I really understood. So I was um, an investor in Cypress, Cypress. Semiconductor with T.J. Rogers. Uh, I That's was on the board and chairman for many, many years. Uh, invested in 84, or 80, no, no, 83. And I was on the board until 97. Um, then um, another successful, very successful semiconductor company is Microchip that you may have heard of, which is in Phoenix, Arizona. That's another company where I had to change the CEO. Uh, we invested in, in uh, Microchip. Uh, we bought basically a division of GI, of General Instrument. They had to divest themselves. And we invested $12 million or something like this, and we bought their semiconductor division. And uh, the company was making EPROMs, and we got sued by Intel, uh, rightly so, by the way, because we're infringing on their, on their patents. And so all of a sudden, we make this investment, and we cannot sell EPROM in the United States. We can sell them outside the United States. But they also had a, uh, a small group making a, a micro, microcontroller called the PIC microcontroller, and so we shifted, shifted gear and went from uh, making EPROMs only to focusing on the PIC microcontroller. And uh, we were very successful with that. And that's what the company is doing now. And, you know, it's a billion, uh, they are a multi-billion dollar company. But there again, I had a, a problem with the CEO and um, I replaced him with a fellow named Steve Sangi. I, I, I hired him from, from Intel. Um, and then um, the third one is um, a company called Menanox that uh, uh, is doing very well. It's about a $500 million or $700 million company. That, that was my last major investment in semiconductors. I also invested in Vitesse, which was a company doing uh, gallium arsenide at first. All these were um, good investment in the semiconductor sector, but in general, at, uh, at Sequoia, I invested in companies mostly in hardware or hardware software. Um, and, um, um, you know, I was very involved in a company called Cisco that you probably know. We invested in Cisco, uh, which was started by a husband and wife team. Um, and um, uh, they didn't have a VP engineering. The, the husband was supposedly be VP Engineering, so Don Valentine went on the board and asked me to be the acting VP Engineering. Uh, that was uh, 1987, I think. No, no, 85. No, so, 87. And then I stayed on for a long time. And also uh, be became CFO, too, uh, right? Weren't you all, didn't you also play a, a role in the finance as well, and financial side with Cisco as well? Yeah, but that was, that was not that difficult. Uh, engineering was much more difficult because we needed desperately to increase the number of engineers and every time I hired an engineer 
and the wife, I, I forget her name, uh, would tell Sandy. me, uh, this guy is brain, brain dead. That was her favorite expression. Uh, I said, you know, not everybody is brain dead, not everybody is as smart as you are, but I need engineers. So I hired uh, uh, engineers. I tried then to hire somebody to replace me. I made the wrong choice, so fired them. Then I got back into running engineering on a daily basis. Uh, you know, I was having two jobs, by the way. I was spending a day a week at, uh, at Cisco and four days a week at, uh, at uh, Sequoia. And then um, eventually, uh, my third choice was the right one. But by that time, I had been running engineering for three years. So um, uh, the company asked me to stay on and uh, do engineering reviews every month. And I did that until 1995. I got a nice plaque out of it, which says uh, "Virtual VP of Engineering." But um, so I was involved. Deep, I was deeply involved in that company. Um, uh, more recently, you know, in 2005, I I was an investor in uh, YouTube, uh, but I was coaching at that time or mentoring Rudolf Boda. So he went on the board, and I was attending uh, board meetings and I'm. Uh, I had um, a tough time with these two young guys, but you know it turned out to be a great investment. I didn't have uh, over the years. I didn't have any, you know, one of these crashing failures. I had some investment that didn't work. I mean, I, I certainly did not bat, uh, you know, a hundred percent, but uh, I didn't have any major crashes where you know it's a company where we end up putting fifty million dollars that goes uh, belly up. How do you explain that? You know, a lot of VCs are talk about the the sort of home run uh, style, where there are a few home runs and some crashing fires. Some people say that it's intuitive and it and it can't be taught, and others feel like there's a sort of a systematic um, method for choosing. How do you explain your your success? Well, it, it, by and large, it is intuitive because a lot of the success depend on the quality of the team. And when you meet people, and even though you spend some time with them, it's only when you see them in action that you find out if they are really good uh, managers or developers or whatever. And, uh, you know, the, the important thing in venture is to make sure you support the companies that are doing well and you cut off quickly the ones that are not doing well. Could we talk more about, you talked about your role with Cyprus and, and with working with TJ. Say a little bit more because as, a, as an investor, you took a very active role in helping shape and build that company. Can you talk yeah, that's, more uh, about that? Yeah, that's both my strength and my weakness, I will admit, is that I tend to take an active role in the companies. Um, you know, it, it's a tough, t when I first started to be a venture capitalist, I had a really tough time because I re it took me some time to realize that I was not in charge. The only thing I could do is, uh, as the word that people use now, I could nudge. I, I could nudge the, the CEO in one direction or another, but it doesn't work to tell him what to do. Were, were there some experiences or incidents that led to that insight for you, what it your role was? It took me some time because you know, I was used to running a company or running a division We'd have a, t a staff meeting, I would listen to everybody, and I would say, this is what we're going to do. Now, I sit in a room uh, very often with people that technically don't understand what's going on. I mean, the directors. And uh, I know the CEO is making the wrong decision, or is going in the wrong direction, at least from my point of view. Or is not hiring the people that are the quality that he should hire is willing to allow for a below power performance. And um, so I, I was, the first three years, I got to tell you, I was very frustrated that, uh, you know, I can't do it. I can't get it, them to do it. It took me some time to realize that the best I could expect is people to listen to me and then decide what they want to do. But you can't force a CEO to do something that he doesn't want to do. Uh, with T.J. Rogers, who, you know, who has a reputation to be a very tough guy, and he is, I have to say something about T.J. He's a good listener. So he would 
disagree fiercely with me during a board meeting, but then he would come back two days later and says, you know, I've thought about it some more, and you were right. Uh, or he would say, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I remember, uh, you've heard, I'm sure, of uh, uh, SPC, you know, Statistical Process Control. And um, I told him, back, this is back in the late 80s, I think it was, I said, we have to institute uh, SPC. And at first he fought me. And then he became a complete advocate of uh, SPC and, uh, and the company uh, did very well in terms of improved quality and, and so on and so forth. So it depends on the individual, but I agree that you need to have intuition, but you also have to have knowledge. And um, the, the problem I see today in venture capital, by the way, is that uh, too many uh, investors that have no experience in a real company. Uh, I'm not saying you have to have 20 years experience, but if you have a few years experience, uh, maybe running an engineering team in a company or be, maybe being the, the CEO of a company, independently of the size, it gives you its experience that's required. And uh, I sit on boards these days where it's clear to me that none of these people sitting around the table with me have had any experience running anything. And, um, you know, it's one thing to run a company that, uh, uh, for instance, in, in the internet field, you know, the, where the only thing that's important is the number of eyes or, or something like this. Um, uh, that's very different from when you work on a, a company that's making something that needs to deliver a product, uh, be it hardware or software for that matter. And uh, there, there is a, a change. I mean, in the, let's say, early days of venture capital, 90s and <coughs> early 2000, many, many venture capitalists um, had experience in, uh, you know, uh, Bert McMurtry uh, is an example. Sure. They had, uh, you know, uh, extensive operating they experience. They had experience. John Doe, you know, had worked at uh, Intel for five or six years. Uh, most, most venture capitalists had experience working in a company at some management level. Now they have great education. I'm not questioning the education, but uh, very few really understand what a company is doing or the problems a company is having. Um, it's, a, it's a problem, I think. I'd like um, to look back with you at those early days when you were at Sequoia, when you were working with people like Don and others who really did have yeah. technical expertise in operating. What was it like working with them and the other partners that you were with in those early days at Sequoia? And how did you decide? I We started in the middle of that story. How did you decide? When so many people were knocking on your door, how did you decide to start working with Don and uh, with well, that fund? Well, first of all, I knew him. Okay. So, um, and then I decided the consulting work was of no interest to me because I, um, I was advising companies and they would or would not follow my advice. Um, uh, you know, the, this company called DEC, okay? So I was advising the semiconductor division of DEC they made a product, uh, uh, a single chip, which was a microvax. You know, they had the vax family of computers. And at that time, there was a company called Sun that was just started. So I tried to convince the management of DEC, uh, Ken Olson was the CEO, that they should make a, a, a workstation based on the vax that would be compatible with the larger machines. and. Uh, they would compete with this. There was another company actually in the Boston area that predates her son, I forget their name now. Apollo. Apollo. Huh? Apollo. Apollo. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It was clear to me that the future was uh, in, uh, in workstations that were uh, you know, uh, interconnected. I mean, they were on, on the network. Networked. On network workstations. <coughs> um, I could not convince him because uh, Ken Olson said that if I do that, it will um, jeopardize the sale of the, of the VAX machine. And uh, 
Uh, you know, he's well known for having come up with a uh, IBM-like uh, PC that was not compatible with the PC because his idea was we want to stay proprietary. Uh, he was, uh, it's interesting because he had a, a, a really a mentality of the 1940s and 50s, if you think about it. You know, we have our own proprietary, and then uh, it was never successful. And if they had come out with a micro it could have changed the destiny of, um, of, so this is 2020 Einstein, mind you, but I was not happy being a consultant. I, I wanted to have more uh, contact with what, uh, what was going on, more influence as well. So um, you're right, it's interesting, by the way, there's still a, a lot of conversation among venture capitalists, what is the, can you train people? Um, I remember having a young uh, uh, fellow uh, at, uh, at Sequoia where I spent a lot of time uh, training uh, uh, associates like uh, Mike Moritz, uh, Doug Leone, uh, Mark Stevens, where all joined as associates. And I was uh, in charge of training them because Don Valentine was and is completely incapable of training anybody. Um, no, I'm serious. He doesn't. He doesn't have the patience. Mm. If you make an error, you're dead. Mm. Uh, he doesn't have the patience. Uh, great investor, uh, by the way. Uh, don't misunderstand me. Don is a great investor, or was a great investor. Um, so I've spent a lot of time with as an associate and uh, rejected at least half of them, uh, maybe more, but. Um, I would spend a lot of time uh, uh, training them and so on and so forth. And you know, it's it's not easy. You need to have a good nose, yes, but you need to be able to understand the technology if you're going to invest in technology. If you don't invest in technology, and uh, technology either software or hardware, and um, you know, uh, Doug, um, you know, got a degree in engineering from Cornell, worked at HP in sales. Uh, Mark Stevens uh, got a degree from USC, a master's, worked at Intel. Uh, the only exception is Mike Moritz. And Mike Moritz was an inter you know, we interviewed, uh, Don and I interviewed Mike Moritz because he approached us. And we were very curious because one of the qual good qualities of a venture capitalist is to ask good questions. You know. Sure. Uh, and you know, being, having been a journalist, uh, Mike was, during his interview, was asking us good questions. So Don and I decided we'll, we'll take a chance on this guy. Uh, you know, he could, he could probably make it, even though he doesn't have a, I mean, he studied uh, history, if I remember correctly. It was really at, out of the Oxford. box thinking, huh? really. Out of the box thinking because he didn't fit the profile of other yeah. VC partners. Yeah. So was that a difficult decision for you to make at the time? Well, you know, every time we hired an associate, we knew we were going to take a risk. Mm. And, uh, and frankly, Mike Moyes did not start very well. Uh, he had some problem starting, but he found out what he was doing wrong and he did better and started making some investment that, that made sense. But, you know, we were very, uh, in, in one way, and that's the reason, by the way, in my view, why Sequoia continues to be successful is that, first of all, we were not unwilling to get rid of people that we didn't think were going to make it. And some of them found jobs in other firms. Um, uh, but um, we were trying to get people to think um, a little bit the same way we were, which was that, um, yes, you need intuition, but the first thing for a venture capitalist is to really evaluate the market potential. Uh, is this a growing market? Is this a new market, but it looks like it could be a big market? If there is uh, questions about the market, that's a black mark. Uh, and then the team. And in general, you find that people choose uh, to go into a product area with a large growing market or a new market, you generally find a pretty good team behind that idea. And then finally, how much money is needed to, to get to a point where you have something valid. But uh, 
marketing market first, people second. And then you can always find the money if you have the right product for the right market with the right team. It will follow. So if those were your core questions and as you were apprentice, as other young associates or new associates were apprenticing with you, what was the process that you undertook to help them kind of accelerate well, their learning uh, and be successful? The process was they would attend board meetings with both Don and I, so they would see how a board works. Uh, when they presented a company at, uh, at, uh, at, a, at a partner's meeting, they ought to be prepared. We checked to see how prepared they were. Don's famous words was, uh, you can attend board meeting, but we don't want to hear you unless we ask you a question. Uh, it Seen was but not me. heard. Don. That was Seen but not heard. <laughs> uh, and in some respects, it's what he was right, because, you know, the partners were Gordon Russell and I and him. And at the beginning, then we let them contribute a little bit more. The first board that they would take on, then either Don or I would sh shadow them. So for instance, uh, more recently, in 2005, when, uh, uh, well, one company was uh, uh, YouTube. Well, that was Rudolf Botter. That was the first company where we let him be the director, mm. but I would shadow him. Mm. And, um, and it was important because when we negotiated the sale of the company to, to Google, even though Rudolf is very, very bright and uh, you know, has a background in finance, he doesn't have a background in you know, negotiations and, and things of this type. And, uh, um, and I helped the company more on uh, the technical side. I mean, there's this thing, and uh, if you Google me, you'll see I'm the man that told them, that told the, the founders more um, bandwidth. That's, well, let's talk about that because Steve Chen many times has uh, given you credit for asking hard questions, for pressing on technical yeah. issues, for talking about, uh, you know, growing audiences. So. Tell more about your well, that, that when relationship. When we made the investment in uh, YouTube, uh, all of what I introduced me to the company because they were two guys from uh, uh, PayPal. I said, right, that looks like a long shot, but let me try to load a video the way that you could uh, uh, on the web. If I can do it, then more people will do it. <laughs> uh, I found it was very easy. Then. They had this video, if you may remember, but you probably don't. Uh, they had a video of uh, a famous Brazilian football player, soccer player, yes. hitting the ball. On, have, you, have you seen the video? I have. Oh, my, that's my old son me is because a soccer I love soccer. <laughs> my, son is, my son plays soccer in Sweden oh. now, so I, we live okay. with soccer. Well, anyway, <laughs> so I met the two guys, and they looked to me like they were particularly bright. Mm. And, uh, and the one thing I, I told them was, you know, when people go on the web and want to uh, watch a YouTube, it's got to be immediate gratification. Mm. That's why I said you need more bandwidth, and this is the reason why I was telling them. I went on. Well, it took me 12 seconds. Mm. Unacceptable. Yeah, no latency. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? And uh, so I convinced them that yes, um, uh, you know, and and I've come to the conclusion in many respects that uh, in venture. And somebody else said it, uh, I will tell you later who said that. Um, uh, time is more expensive than money. In other words, if you have the funds, you should focus on reducing the time to, to mark the development time. Even if, if, even if you spend more money, because if you're on the market fa earlier, faster, it will enable uh, it's a very important for the company to be successful. Uh, the person that said that actually different words is Elon Musk. Mm. But uh, not, I don't particularly admire Elon Musk, but uh, I thought that it was very, he put in words something I'd been thinking about for a long time. Mm. That um, when you reach a certain point, it's worthwhile putting the foot on the accelerator and spend more money to get over the next hurdle because getting to market earlier is much more important than 
the way that which we spend money. And that's, uh, I, I always had that in the back of my mind, but I never really, uh, you know, I was able to put words around it. So that was a key part of your contribution for YouTube. Were there other companies? Well, where well other companies too. Tell, tell uh, me about some of the other you know, companies uh, that. There was a company, uh, Redback uh, Networks. Redback Networks. There, it was interesting because, um, well, there are two things. In First of all, I pressed them very hard to put the, the product on the market as soon as possible. Because I said, you know, you have Cisco, you have everybody else looking over our shoulder. We need to get our territory. And they did that. But then the company was ready to go public. This was 1997, I think, or whatever, 99. Just before the, the big communication you know, bubble, the telecom bubble. And uh, we filed to go public at $450 million valuation. And there is a public company that made an offer to buy us out. And the CEO said, I'd like to do that. It's a lot less risky than going public. And, uh, uh, and I, want to, I want to sell. So I said, no, we're not going to sell. And uh, I had a semi-revolution on my hand from his staff. So I had a meeting with uh, all the staff, and I told them, you're making a mistake. The way the public market is, um, we should go public. And uh, I'll bet you that uh, the stock will double very quickly. Well, I was wrong. The company went public, and within a few months, it was worth $5 billion. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you know, uh, you, you may remember that time where uh, telecom companies were it's, just it's sort of walking, irrational, on, walking on water. Yeah, irrational exuberance exactly. at the time. So uh, actually I have to say that a number of them, including the, the CEO, uh, sent me some nice letters thanking me. <laughs> As they should. Them to, <laughs> so, you know, there are some things like this in, in venture that are sort of, uh, sort of interesting, but going back to the point you asked me about what makes a good investor uh, helping the company select the best people I get very involved in the early days and I said if you want to hire a VP engineering or a VP sales I want to interview him or her so when you're in those interviews what what made your ability? Is it the questions? Or what the vetting? What 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 enabled you to be so um, helpful in key, creating well, those key positions? Well, first of all, I think I'm a pretty good judge of people. So um, I love to when I interview somebody, I ask very few questions. Mm. I want people to talk to me. Mm. I find I learn a lot more than by asking questions. But in certain cases, I very I have very specific questions. If you're an engineer, I want you to tell me about the last project you worked on and what problems you hit and how did you solve the problem. If you're a young PhD, I say, please tell me what was your thesis and uh, explain it to me. Assume I know nothing. So I've heard things about quantum computing or X-ray amplifier, X-band amplifiers or stuff like that. That I understand better than quantum computing. I always try to get the interviewee to, if it's a salesperson, I ask two questions. One is, um, how did sales in your area increase in the last three years? By how much? Mm -hmm. And how do you explain why they mm. increased? Um, another question, important question to ask from a salesman is, what was your W2? <laughs> uh, yes. How much of it was fixed and how much of it was bonus? Mm -hmm. You want a salesman that's very hungry. Mm -hmm. That he makes a 150 base, but 500 total, you know, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. There's no magic. You know, interviewing people, there's no magic. You got to get, uh, find a way to know the person. I don't ask questions like, you know, uh, personal questions. Um, I'm very curious very often of especially among young engineers, uh, uh, what is your education and how did you do in college? Mm. How did you, what sort of grades did you get? Mm. Turns out that people have 
good grades do better mm. in general. Not always, mm -hmm. not always, but in general. So that's, it's not that difficult. But helping the CEO recruit a first-class team, I think, is uh, it's part of my job. As, as a member of the board. Now, I'm not going to interview, you know, young engineers or, but like yesterday, uh, I'm on the board of a company, company called Cerebras, and I interviewed uh, a very, very good guy who is at, in, uh, at Google right now, uh, PhD in uh, artificial intelligence and stuff like that, and, um, uh, you know, he's, he's going to be a senior engineer, not a, not a but, we need top talent, and so I spend an hour with him, partially interviewing it, but partially selling him. So that's the job of a venture capitalist. It's not just to be a purveyor of money, because um, you know, companies are not successful because of money, they're successful because of people. Yes. And if you have the best people, generally you're successful. So I, I found that, um, uh, Sequoia was a, was a really great experience for me. Then I, I was ready to resign, I actually resigned because I was going to retire. And Vinod Kosla, you know, contacted me. Now I had known Vinod for 20 years or so. And I was interested because he was going to invest in, uh, in clean tech. And, uh, and I, wasn't going to, I wasn't getting much support from people at Sequoia about clean tech. It turns out they were right, by the way, <laughs> because clean tech is not a good place to invest. Um, it's actually a terrible place to invest. But at the time, we didn't know that. Huh? At the time, it was hard to know that. Well, you think, or do you think that it was, is it just the benefit read, of hindsight? I should have hindsight? read the tea leaves. You should have. Yeah. You would have I read them in differently. In retrospect, you know, it's 2020 hindsight. Mm. But I went to, I went to Kostler Ventures, uh, and um, I didn't enjoy my time there. Was what, 2009? Uh, that was so? 2009 to 2013. Mm -hmm. um, Vinod is very, very smart, but he has a very, very tough time in working as part of a team. Mm. He wants to make all the decisions. Mm. So uh, after two years, I decided I wanted to leave, but I couldn't leave because if I had left, it would really have hurt him trying to raise his next fund. And I felt, you know, I made a wrong decision, but you can't, you know, I have an obligation not to torpedo him. So I stayed until he raised his next fund, then I left. And I started making, uh, uh, by the way, I made one interesting investment at Costa, which is Skybox. Have do you, you know that Skybox? Yeah, do you know that Ching Yu? Huh? Ching Yu Hu, one of the co founders, oh, yeah. is actually on the next gen board here at the museum, which reports up uh, to me here. So, yes, I know about oh, Skybox, yeah. to Google, to Terabella, and now, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I do know. But, you know, investing in a, in a satellite at that time, mm -hmm. everybody on Central World thought I was crazy. How yeah. did you make that decision? Because that was, a, that was unusual, their, their concept. Their business model was When I met the team, I was uh, pretty impressed with them. Mm -hmm. uh, they seemed to know what they were going to get into. It turns out that they didn't know as much as I thought they did. Uh, but um, I could see there was a great opening for a company making a, bringing, if you don't mind me so and so, the satellite industry back up to present day technology. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if you know it, but NASA uses technology that's on average 15 years old. Hmm. Uh, just like you know the armed forces. Because they want to make so sure that everything is solid, it takes years and years of, exp uh, of testing. Uh, and it moves very slowly. The big companies that you know big, put these big satellites in orbits, uh, it, this uh, costs $500 million or something like this. They last a long time, but they don't have the capabilities that, uh, that uh, Skybox promised, which is we'll have a, uh, you know, a flotilla of satellites so that you can get a picture of any place in the Earth within an hour instead of days or weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel that was pretty interesting, and I did some work on the market and found out that, yes, 
there was a need for more uh, up to the time uh, pictures. And um, they convinced me they could make a satellite for $3 million and launch it for another three. They were wrong on both counts. Mm -hmm. First of all, it turned out that we could not find a telescope which would enable us to take pictures. We could not find a commercial one. They thought we could. Uh, so we had to have one designed. It cost a lot more money than we expected. Um, the satellite grew in size from 70 kilograms to close to 100. But, um, and it cost a lot more than we expected. And then the launching, we found out, cost, was costing a lot more than we expected. But, you know, we eventually, uh, even though we were delayed by the Russians, we eventually put a satellite in orbit that works to this day, uh, even though at first we thought it would last only two years. And overall, they did a pretty darn good job. And the big difference is that we use commercially available components. Mm -hmm. So the cost of the satellite was so a lot less than, uh, than NASA. Uh, NASA uh, doesn't know that uh, there's a thing called redundancy. <laughs> <laughs> and that you also software is so good these days that you can do corrections even if you have a problem. Uh, so, you know, um, the company, uh, from a commercial point of view, I don't think the company is successful even to this day. Uh, they, it could have been successful, I think, uh, even if Google had not acquired us. But when Google acquired us, made an offer to acquire us, I have one rule, uh, which is that if the management want to sell, sell. Hmm. Because what am I going to do? Replace the management? Do it myself? That's not going to happen. So we sold. Uh, it was, a, from an investment point of view, it was a, a, a good investment. Was it uh, 400 but million, it, or what was the, do you remember the purchase so price? 550 million. 550. Yeah. It was a, a big win for Kosla Ventures. Mm -hmm. The other win I, I had was a company called C Micro. Mm -hmm. I mean, the funny thing is that I, I invested there, and the only two companies in which I really made money, or the fund made money, uh, were not. Uh, clean tech companies. Mm. C Micro was a low power server, uh, uh, the founder of which, by the way, is now the CEO of Cerebras, the company I also invested in. Um, and then the next uh, uh, investment that they made that's successful is the Square, you know, the payment system. Sure. And there uh, I uh, got involved in the company, I met with the CEO. Um, at Green, the restaurant in San Francisco, uh, with um, uh, what's his name, Gordon uh, Gideon Yu. Gideon Yu, yes. Yeah. Gideon yeah. Yu invested me, uh, in, uh, inter introduced me, and we bought it to uh, to you know, Kosla, and we made the investment, and uh, it's turning out to be the savior of the fund. But um, no, Kosla was not a good experience for me. Um, so I left, I started making investments on my own, you know, as an angel, I did maybe 20 investments, mostly in hardware, mm. because I decided I can't compete with uh, people that are investors in, in software, you know, they're looking, they're all looking for the next Facebook, and I don't like that, I don't understand it, um, uh, and um, so I focused on hardware, and I've made I made a few investments, uh, uh, some of which are, look like they're very successful. You know a company called Lear? I don't. L-E-I-A, -E like Lear for the movie? Mm -hmm. They have developed a 3D display that doesn't require lasers. It's a true 3D, uh, you know, like you see a holographic uh, display, mm -hmm. not using, um, Actually, I should introduce you to them because I think you should have one of their products in this museum. It's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely okay. amazing. Please do. When you we, see it. we should learn about it's them. It's 3D on a cell phone. You can look on the side and you see, you know, and they are successful. I mean, they're going to be in cell phones this year uh, for sale in, 1980, in 2018. Um, I invested in a company called CNEX. I invested in a few companies. And then I met this guy, Leo Susan, 
Oh, before we jump ahead to that, I want to ask a little bit. Well, you had you talked about the focus on hardware. Was there any geographic focus, or was it all around, here. all close by? Yeah, here. Mm -hmm. I don't like to travel mm -hmm. for business. Mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, here. Um, you know, I, I made investments in. Uh, I was looking for companies that had a hardware and a software. I mean. There's no such thing, in my view, as pure hardware sure, these days. Sense. So, you know, you're not looking for somebody that's making a simple box. You want an intelligent box. I mean, you see what I mean? So, uh, they were either in electronics or um, uh, no consumer to speak of, mm -hmm. not, none. Um, I invested in a company in 3D printing, metal mm -hmm. printing. Mm -hmm. um, I sold my investment in that. Um, th these type of things. Um, I invested in a company making a, a very, very small hearing aid hmm. that you can insert in the ear and nobody sees. Hmm. It's really nanotechnology. Hmm. You want to see it? I do. And it's rechargeable. Pretty interesting. Yes. It's a big market. An it's a big market. Yeah. An interesting application area. I'm marginally deaf. Um, I've lost 20% here and 24% here. Mm. I just feel more comfortable wearing them because like this I can hear without having to, you know, focus. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and then um, I invested in a, in a few companies in uh, syst uh, systems, uh, memory systems and mm -hmm. things of this type. Areas that I know, you know, that I think I can help the company in one way or another. Um, so, I'm I'm happy with my investments. I've I've made one biotech investment, believe it or not. So that's out of the pattern. What, what completely prompted that? out of the pattern. But uh, and it's a complete gamble. Hmm. I have to admit, it's uh, something to do with Alzheimer. Hmm. Because if you ask me, um, you don't, but I will tell, give you the answer anyway. <laughs> if you ask me, uh, you know, I'm 80, 86 years old. Mm. Uh, it's amazing. Huh? I'm amazed. I could do the <laughs> math, but I, I'm amazed that you're 86. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be 87, unfortunately. <laughs> Fourth of July, did you in, say? Uh, in September. 12th. Oh, in September. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I don't think about my age, to the truth. I mean, uh, you know, I don't get up in the morning and say, oh my God, I'm 86. <laughs> uh, no, I find that, um, you know, there are some things that I can't do the way I used to. Uh, for instance, I can't play tennis anymore. Mm. Uh, but uh, other than that, so anyway, uh, I forget the train of my thoughts, but, you know, I. Alzheimer, I, your Alzheimer's, that's out of the yeah, box, your biotech Alzheimer's investment. Alzheimer's is the only thing I'm afraid of. Hmm. Well, somebody came to me with an idea that I thought, uh, from my limited knowledge, scientifically correct. I had one of my friends at UCSF, we uh, were fairly close to UCSF, which, which means we have given money <laughs> to UCSF. Uh, let's be honest about it. <coughs> I asked them what they thought of the idea, so I invested in a company. Hmm. Uh, the, idea, the idea of the company is that Alzheimer is caused by a microbial infection of the brain. Really? Interesting. Hmm. We'll see. Hmm. Uh, we have proof in dogs, but that's not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see. I'll let you know more a year from now. Well, I'd be vitally interested. Before we uh, move into your formation eight time, I'd over the stories that you've been talking about with Sequoia and Kosla Co Ventures, you've talked about people, entrepreneurs that you worked with and then subsequently worked with them in another project. Gideon Yu is a good example. Can you say a little bit more about the people that, as you say, it's all about the people and these relationships of a few people that you found to be trusted partners or collaborators. Can you say a little bit more about that for time? Well, for you know, a repeat uh, investors. Unfortunately, people uh, are in your life for a while and then they disappear. I mean, you know, they are going in their own direction, so uh, there are a lot of people that 
I mean, I still have contacts occasionally with T.J. Rogers. We still have dinner occasionally. Uh, but um, in this business, you find that pe people eventually uh, move around, go into a completely different direction. Um, I still am very close to um, a, a couple of guys that I mentored when I was at Costa Venture. One is named uh, Ilya Fushman. He's now with... Uh, um, Index Fund, uh, another one is Rami Adib, and he is going to start his own fund. So they keep track of me because they are now in the venture capital business as well. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you lose track of people very quickly, mm -hmm. very quickly. Occasionally I hear back from somebody from way back when that says, oh, I, I saw your name, I need help on this, or uh, how are you, I mean, you know, this type of things. But I don't... Um, I very rarely, actually, if I think back, uh, Andrew Feldman, the founder and CEO of Cerebras, is probably one of the few that I invested in the second company that he started. I don't, I can't think of others. But um, you know, uh, when I was at Costa, I invested also in a company called C Micro. Oh uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, CEO. Double E O. Mm -hmm. That's a, a battery company. Battery company, company right? Uh, yeah. And. Uh, I, I was very friendly with the CEO, but he's now gone into a different company, so we keep in touch occasionally. Um, um, CEO is a, is a company that got sold to uh, Bosch. Uh, actually, it's going to be successful. It's going to be one of the few battery companies that's successful, but uh, battery is a tough business. Um, <laughs> very tough. I know I don't have any, I don't have a network of people that I can still stay in touch with. Um, there's a lot of movement. Mm -hmm. It's like the, you know, the tide coming in and, and getting out. Um, I, don't, I don't have any many uh, relationship with people, for instance, that, um, that I invested in at, um, uh, at Sequoia. I occasionally see some of them, but it's mostly in a, a social occasion, like uh, Steve Chen, I, I see him. I saw him at the uh, Asian Museum. Mm -hmm. um, um, people, people like that. I don't, I don't. Um, I, and uh, you know, I try to be very friendly to the CEOs, but I want, I don't want to be very social with them. Mm -hmm. Like I, I would invite them occasionally with their wife to have dinner with my wife, but I don't want to be too much of a friend because you don't know what the, I mean, what the relationship is going to be. Are they going to be successful and I'll be very happy that, that I'm a friend of theirs or am I going to be in a position to tell them you're not doing the job? Yes, those and difficult conversations. It's a difficult conversation mm -hmm. if you become too friendly. Yes. Uh, so that's the reason and um, I'm not that friendly with many venture capitalists because I find them boring, most of them. <laughs> Well, I'm a, I'm a snob, I have to admit. <laughs> but, you know, I have interest. Uh, if you ask me what my life is beyond business, mm -hmm. I have a family. Yes. Uh, six grandchildren. Mm. One of them is married, mm. trying to make a child, as they say these days. <laughs> um, um, the other one is go another one is going to get married next year. I have two smaller ones that are three and five from our son. He started later. Um, so that's occupying me. Uh, Christine and I love to collect art, and mm. we have uh, an art collection uh, what are, who that's are very th significant, but we keep it very private. Mm -hmm. uh, the type of art we like is not necessarily liked by everybody. Uh, very tough art. Anyway, it hits you in the stomach when you see it the first time. Anyway, uh, that's to give you a slow. You should censor this part of the. <laughs> <laughs> People don't have to know much about me. I like to be more um, anonymous as as anonymous as possible. Mm. I don't like the limelight. Mm. Um, uh, there are too many venture capitalists these days that. Uh, 
promote themselves a little bit too much. Mm. So, you know, I, I am now, I met uh, Leo Susan, um, um, and uh, he was, he had just left uh, Flextronics and he started a fund focus on hardware. Mm -hmm. And so, well, this is a guy that thinks like I do. I got to know him better, and we decided to start, to start a fund. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he actually did, mo he did all, I should say, of the fundraising. And we have a fund. Uh, the first one is already fully in invested, $125 million, focusing on very early stage hardware companies. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, are fo and we are really keeping the focus. We're not doing software we're not doing anything out of there and uh, we raised another fund uh, 175 million dollar early stage and 125 million dollar follow-up and we are investing and uh, I have uh, a few investments I'll tell you about them mostly uh, a company in robotics and artificial intelligence called Kindred uh, uh, located in San Francisco with a AI lab, artificial intelligence uh, uh, lab in Toronto. Unbeknownst to me, uh, Canada is the world capital of, uh, of artificial intelligence. Yes. Uh, we have 14 people in AI in Toronto, which mm. very, very capable guys. We're developing uh, robots that have some level of intelligence. Uh, you know, uh, they can learn on the job to do more different things. The first application we're going after is for fulfillment centers to pick up things and put them in a box to be shipped. Right now, it's people that have to da be that, do that. It's a completely uh, boring job. You know, you take something, you put it in front of a scanner, you put it in the box. <laughs> uh, you'd be surprised there are 40,000 people in this country doing that. Mm. There are 400,000 people working in, f in fulfillment centers. So we're, we are in testing this, and we have a, a very strong artificial intelligence group. And the idea is that at first we have, the robot is basically tele teleoperated by a, a human being, and less and less as it goes, you see what I mean? So at the beginning it's 80%, and at the end it's 1%. Sure, has the learning. And then mm -hmm. I have an uh, investment in Cerebras, which uh, they are the companies in stealth mode. I'll just tell you it's uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, then I have an investment in a company called Diasys. Um, this, when I say I have an investment, these are investments I'm responsible. Mm -hmm. Diasys is developing some hardware and software for, and um, biotechnology to basically do very quick tests of things like the flu. Do you have the flu or mm -hmm. do you have a cold? Mm -hmm. If you have the flu, you can mm -hmm. cure it. And they also have an application uh, that's going to take two, they are very close to market now uh, for STDs, you know. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, STD, uh, this is sexually, yes. that are silent for women. Mm. And so, and eventually the idea eventually is that there'll be a test you can do at home, and you can find out I if there is a problem or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have, you know, uh, it's it's better for, for people instead of having to go to a clinic. Um, this is a company out of uh, Berkeley. Um, I'm investor in a company called Flex Logics. Actually, it's a semiconductor field, uh, developing IP and uh, technology. Uh, Run by a fellow named Jeff Tate. He was the founder of Rambus. And the idea is to develop IP to uh, have FPGAs incorporated uh, in other chips. The company is just starting, uh, doing uh, pretty well. I'm involved in an ag tech company, mm. um, developing technology for, ag for precision agriculture. So altogether, what's your current portfolio of companies that you're actively invested in, maybe sitting on boards I have, uh, currently? I am involved directly and completely in six companies. Mm. Totally, we have 37 or 40, 40 companies in the portfolio by now. Um, okay. We have, uh, I have three, par four partners. Uh, 
one of which is Leo, the other one is a fellow named Greg Renshaw, who used to be the uh, CEO of uh, Tesla. Uh, he has an interesting background because he started at Cyprus. Mm. And then uh, was at uh, um, uh, Sun Power, and then he was hired by Elon Musk to, was, to run uh, manufacturing at Tesla. Interesting. So that's it. And uh, here I am now. So I'd love to take a s step back. You're still very actively investing, but I'd like to hear you've also been a leader on the industry level. You were president of the Western Venture Capital Association. This is long, long, long time, time ago. ago. But with that perspective of now venture investing since the 80s, how would you characterize or where the evolution of venture capital as an industry and sort of risks and opportunities of the industry as a whole now? Do you have comments well, on that? Uh, you probably know the statistics better than I do, but I find it interesting that out of the, I don't know how many venture firms there are now, somewhere around 700 how few are really successful. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that there are so many com uh, venture firms that survive even though I would not put my money there. Yeah. Uh, and it's been going for years. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be there were 30, 40 firms that were giving reasonable returns. Now, the 10? Yeah. Because it's... Uh, it's uh, you should not invest in venture capital uh, uh, because very few firms are making money, are making real money. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the fact that you know it's completely liquid, it doesn't make sense to. Mm -hmm. I remember having a dinner with Tom Perkins, you know, the, of Tanya sure. Perkins, and uh, some. It was a social dinner. And a lady sitting next to him said, "Tom, I would, I want to invest in, uh, in." Uh, venture capital, uh, and she is a widow. She's fairly wealthy, but she's a widow. And Tom said, this is quite a few years ago, don't. Don't do it. Don't invest, invest <laughs> unless you can invest with one of the few firms which really gives returns. Uh, and that's, that's strange, you know. You would think mm. that uh, 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 investors, I mean, the uh, limited partners would realize that unless you can invest in, in the likes of uh, uh, Sequoia and a few and a couple of others, uh, you should not invest. Mm -hmm. You should not invest. Mm -hmm. And so, what I'm uh, telling my partners, because you know, they've never been in venture, I said, you know, there's only one thing that counts in venture: cash on cash. Mm -hmm. Because I can easily show you great IRR, uh, because I can sell a company in one year and show a tremendous IRR, but. What people want is they want to put a dollar in and get four or five or more dollars out. And uh, I, I'm amazed at, at uh, what's going on in venture capital. I really am amazed. In any other industry, all, all these things would not, would not be able to uh, re-up. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing that's happening is all the uh, incredible numbers of of really small funds. I'm not talking about a hundred million dollars, but there are people that raise 50 million mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or, or something like this, and then they make small investments, and the CEOs do not understand that it's important to invest in firms that will be able to do at least one follow-up round. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason, by the way, why we decided at, uh, at, uh, at Eclipse to have a larger fund so we can put four million dollars in the first round and then ten million dollars in, in the, the second, next round. Sure, we, we don't have to invest uh, forever, but mm -hmm. at least uh, show significant support for the company um, in the next rounds. Um, and so, and, and these micro funds are creating a lot, lot of noise on the signal because they tend to invest in all sorts of things that should not be invested in. Not every idea deserves money. Um, you're going to see, uh, find that I'm tough. I mean, I'm not unfair, though. <laughs> that's the best kind of tough, right? No, but it's, uh, yeah. it's there's too much of that going on right mm -hmm. now. What are your thoughts about the Valley? You've, you've been here helping drive and grow the Valley over now successive generations where it's been able to create and recreate its leading edge. 
Um, what's your assessment now as the Valley now and, and looking ahead? Well, you know, the reason the Valley has been successful so, lo so long is just a networking effect. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not anything else. I mean, if you get a degree at MIT and you look what's available around uh, MIT in terms of uh, investments uh, or capable investors, I should say, uh, you, come to, you come to the Bay Area, you come to Silicon Valley. Uh, I see one major, it's not shown up completely yet, but it's going to show up. It's impossible to live here on the cost of living. Mm -hmm. you know, when I explain to people that in the 60s and 70s and even early 80s, it was fairly easy to move people here. At one time, I remember hiring people on the East Coast because it was cheaper to live in California than to live in Boston. <laughs> That's a distant memory for housing. <laughs> well, that shows you how old I am. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting that uh, what's happening is that it's not the cost of living per se, it's the real estate. Mm -hmm. So if you're single and you live with a buddy somewhere in an apartment in San Francisco, you can afford it because it's going to cost you $1,500 a month and 3000 between the two of you. But if you're married mm -hmm. and you want to have a family, which occasionally people want to do that, <laughs> you can't do that here. I mean, it's becoming nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you make $500,000 a year, it's difficult to buy a house. Mm -hmm. uh, 500000 you know, after tax, it's less than that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think this is going to force the slowing of Silicon Valley. And uh, I'm not saying that it's going to emigrate in Phoenix or in Austin or uh, not in Boston, because Boston is getting close to here in terms of cost of living, but it's going to disperse because people can't afford to move here. I mean, we have a constant problem hiring somebody from outside the area and moving him here or her uh, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, so if you hire a VP sales, it's okay if he resides in Colorado or someplace. But if you want to hire a VP engineering, he has to move here. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't do it. I mean, I know of a case of somebody that uh, was in the Chicago area, was at uh, Illinois Urbana with a PhD, and he said, you know, I get a job uh, in Minneapolis uh, and I, I can buy a house very quickly. If I come here, what am I going to do? <laughs> and so I think that's going to hurt Silicon Valley in the long run. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, uh, unless we build a lot more reasonably priced apartments. Yeah, the push for high density housing. Yeah. On, so that's a major concern as you look at are there any upsides? Or why do people continue to gravitate here? Why do you continue to focus on the pipeline here? Are there sort of strengths that you see as sustaining strengths for the valley? Well, I, I don't think it's going to collapse. Things don't collapse, mm -hmm. you know that. Uh, I think that slowly but surely there'll be more startups in Washington. Uh, not Washington, D.C., Washington Seattle, State. Seattle, around mm -hmm. Seattle. We see some of them mm -hmm. uh, out of uh, Microsoft and so on and so forth. Um, I think that uh, you'll see more and more companies started. Uh, you know, we've made now three investment in the Boston area, mm -hmm. although I don't like it, but this is where the companies are mm -hmm. and they can't move here. These are all startups. Mm -hmm. They can't move here. They would love. They would have loved to move here, but they can't afford to. They're already based in Boston. Boston is not that cheap, but you know, if you look, if you don't live in a certain areas, there there's a lot of rooms around, uh, a lot of room around Boston, so you can live in one of the suburbs, mm -hmm. and the cost, the cost of real estate, are, I don't know, forty percent less than here. Mm -hmm. It's not that cheap, but forty percent makes a difference. So we have three companies there. We invested in a 3D uh, printing company, a very interesting one, and a 
a robotics company um, and um, in, a, in another industrial controlled company. Uh, we have one company in Toronto. Uh, we're looking at one company in, in, in LA because LA is cheaper than here and we don't want them to move. They are out of Caltech, they might as well stay there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how long it will take. I, I would not predict, but I, I would say that you'll see a slow erosion. Mm. Interesting. I, you don't I think so. I'm an optimist, but I, uh, for long-term reasons about why the valley isn't able to reinvent itself. You see, I'm an optimist about a uh, number of startups. I think number the number startups. of startups, and I'm talking about quality startups, mm -hmm. is not going to decrease. Mm -hmm. It's not going to decrease. I think uh, it's going to go on increasing. I think that's one great advantage of this country over many other countries. Uh, the uh, s you know, entrepreneurship, the ease of starting a company, the ease of getting capital, uh, the infrastructure in terms of legal and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think we continue to have an advantage that's measurable over other countries, maybe except the UK, mm -hmm. maybe except the UK. Um, but there's a mentality uh, here that doesn't exist in continental Europe, even though there are startups in France, doesn't compare to here. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the major problems of France is that a lot of the brains are getting out. Um, I'm serious. Yeah. I'm really serious. There's a brain drain in France. Yeah, there's a, the flow of people are moving away. Yeah, the, the there talent. Are French people around here, mm -hmm. uh, but the United States will. I don't I'm not worried about the startups, mm -hmm. but I'm telling you there'll be more startups in places where there are great universities, like you know Texas, uh, University of Texas, or around mm -hmm. uh, Boston. Not necessarily New York. Um, we have one investment uh, out of Northwest mm -hmm. in uh, in in Chicago. A great company, great idea both hardware and software, great idea. Mm. Well, you've been so, so I'm optimistic from that point of view. I am, and thank you, because I was going to ask you about how you look at what's happening in other clusters, so you answered that question, you anticipated my question. I'd like to close um, my part of this conversation by asking where part of the museum is to, not a, to uh, preserve the legacy of, of history, but also to inform and inspire the next generation. Yeah. So as you think about your tremendous experience and insight, what words of advice or lessons learned could you share for the next generation young entrepreneur or venture capitalist who's looking to you for some advice? My advice to entrepreneur mm -hmm. is that um, entrepreneurship requires a special gene you can't force yourself to be an entrepreneur. Either you want to be an entrepreneur and you understand you're taking a lot of risk at being an entrepreneur. But when I see uh, universities teaching entrepreneurship, I laugh. <laughs> because either you're an entrepreneur, either you want to start something or you don't. Mm. Um, and um, I mean, I, I think it's important though to, for people to continue to look at risk reward. I mean. By being an entrepreneur, you take a lot of risk. So take it at the right time. Don't wait until you're married and you have two children to take too much risk. Do it at a time where if it doesn't work, you're the only one that suffers. But um, there's nothing more exciting <coughs> than to start your own company. Uh, you, know. you can look back and said, like having a child <laughs> in some respects. Uh, it has the same problems, by the way, because having a child is uh, sometimes, uh, you know, they don't all turn out well. I've been lucky. Uh, but uh, uh, <coughs> having, having built something, uh, being able to look back and say, I did that, is great satisfaction. It's more than just the money, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, because if the only motivation you have is money, go to Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Motivation is you want to build something. You want to contribute something to society. Not 
you may disagree with what fa uh, Facebook is contributing to society. Uh, I won't argue that point, but you did con he did contribute something. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that w when you start a company, the, the big thing is to feel that you have achieved something in your life. Well, we here are very focused on the tech impact through technology innovation, economic value creation, social impact. When you think about your legacy, I know you're a very modest person, but what are the things that you would like to be remembered for, for the impact that you've had these areas or others? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's a tough question. I don't know what I want to be remembered for. I mean, um, I get people sending me emails saying, I remember how tough you were. Thank you. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, I continue to be pretty tough. Mm -hmm. No, I think that uh, I, I don't know that I have a, a, a legacy necessarily, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I did what I thought I should do. Mm -hmm. That's it. Great. And I, I don't plan on retiring right now. Clearly. So um, you have six investments now and more to come. It sounds like you're yeah. a... I, you know, as long as I enjoy what I'm doing and as long as I feel I'm contributing something, um, like, you know, when I leave here, I have a meeting at Cerebras, actually, because I'm helping them on some technical matter right now. Um, or I should say I'm giving them advice. Mm -hmm. They don't need any help. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think that... Um, I, I I was very I've I've been very lucky, you know. Mm. Very mm. lucky. Well, that that's a wonderful way to end, Pierre. Thank you so much. It's been a, a really an honor to have you here at the museum. Thank you. Please. No, you know, if I had to give advice to young people right now, uh, and I'm happy they asked me that question, because a lot of people have asked me that question, is what's going to happen with all these robots? Mm. Concerned it's going about to have a major impact on employment. On employment? Major, major impact. These Empl robots. So your robots biggest concern is on job, job and, uh, displacement? It's a very tough question. Job displacement. Because, you know, I, I, I have an inv we have an investment in six robotic company. Mm -hmm. four, four of them are doing very well. <laughs> we know what that means. This company, this company, Kindred, uh, at one of our potential customers, is going to replace 30 jobs out of 40. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the case in many other places. So if, if, we, were, if we had 100% of the market, we would eliminate 30,000 jobs. Mm -hmm.